Hello everyone. Today I'm going to talk about computational models for biological networks. In the previous week we talked about pathways. You know how important they are in order to model our biological network. Uh, just a minute, we have a little technical issue. I'm trying to load the slides. It will take time, but anyway, you are hearing me, so let's talk about it until you can uh, view the slides. So uh, we talked about pathways last week, and you know where to find them. Uh, there are some websites related to that, but I told you that KEG website could be very useful because it contains many valid pathways. And we talked about it that these pathways are not 100%, uh, they are not 100% accurate, but at least it gives us some ideas that uh, what's going on in terms of that biological system. And we have different computational models to deal with them, to model them. And uh, one of them is PetriNet. Uh, the other one, reaction systems. And there are so many of them. So it's very hard to list them all because each scientist prefer, prefer a specific model. And each day we are facing uh, new computational models to deal with such biological systems. Yeah, fortunately, I think now the slides are loaded, so you can see the slides. Let's test it. I hope there's no problem with viewing the slides now. Okay, so there are several methods to deal with that, as I said. PetNet and reaction system, personally, I worked with them. That's why I chose these two. Uh, otherwise, it's not, uh, it, I cannot claim, for example, they are the best ones, but uh, it depends on the biological system that you are modeling with. And now I talk about the challenges we have for computational models and also what are the advantages of them. So. Let's uh, give an example related to biological network, like this one. Uh, this image is related to hemoglobin switching. So uh, hemoglobin goes through changes. It means that there are some gene expressions which are upregulated and downregulated through time. This part until unit three is related to embryonic stage. From three to nine, or even we could say 12, we are dealing with fetal uh, stage. And starting from nine uh, until the person is alive, so we are dealing with adult hemoglobin. Now, as you can see, the level of gene expressions are changing through time. Like for example, gamma, is upregulated during the fetal life, but it starts to be downregulated uh, in the adult life. So that's why we call it a switching. And as you can see for beta, this is a different story. And hemoglobin also deals with alpha, which is not uh, included in this picture. Also, there might be other genes involved with it, but usually we try to simplify everything in order to have easier time for modeling. But you may say, if we neglect some uh, important factors, what will happen? Uh, would it be natural? Would it give us the correct model? Yes, these are the challenges that we are facing uh, in computational modeling. So we try to include uh, components which are involved in it as much as possible. Now, based on the pathways, we can design our model. So this is a pathway. And uh, based on the articles that we are reading from other researchers, maybe we understand that there should be more to it. For example, when you find a pathway inside CAG website, maybe there are more components involved, then you can add it to your pathway. It's okay. 
because this is your model and then you should show that this is working properly and you should validate that. So for beta globin and gamma globin in this hemoglobin switching network, you can see that you have such a pathway. There are some uh, proteins and components involved in this. For example, you know that KLF1 is upregulating gen the gene expression of beta. And this multi-complex protein, this one inhibits gamma expression. And that's the reason in this picture you can see gamma is downregulating after a time and beta is upregulated. So as you can see by using such pathways, you can show what's going on in details in terms of biological networks. Now, we can use different computational methods. One of them is reaction systems. Uh, reaction systems could be useful for uh, just as specifying that whether a protein uh, level or, for example, mRNA level uh, is high or low, or, for example, if the gene expression is upregulated or downregulated. Like by showing the components of inputs, outputs, and inhibition. For example, in the previous picture, uh, this part is inhibition. So when you have such a multi-complex protein, whenever you have it as input, then you should know that it inhibits, for example, uh, gamma gene expression. So by using those two, uh, three components, you can uh, specify exactly what's going on in, of, uh, in terms of biological networks. Uh, what's the disadvantage of that? The thing is that I'm interested to know what is exactly the level, or even not exactly, well, approximately what's the level of the mRNA that I'm looking for, how much of a beta chain I will have at the end. This type of questions, unfortunately, reaction systems uh, cannot answer. And that's a big disadvantage of that. So this one can be useful, as I said, to just know whether at the end we will have some, for example, gamma chain or beta chain, or this is totally uh, knocked down. And that's why we can predict things using reaction system. But there are other computational methods like uh, petri nets as a directed graph mathematical method. This one can be very useful because this is very flexible and we can add different properties to it. And by using that, you can even understand approximately what would be the level, for example, for uh, beta globin. So this petri net that you can see here is derived from this pathway. So it takes time to be uh, to get yourself familiar with how you can model everything in terms of patronet. But as soon as you do, things uh, will be much easier for you to deal with that. But before that, we should know about the properties related to patronet. So the classical one is a discrete patronet. It means that here in this picture, you have places and transitions. These uh, circular ones, there are places. They can denote the entities, like for example, mRNA, genes, protein. So these circles can identify them, even mutations. Even for in terms of mutations, you can show it by using places. Transitions are the actions happening in biological systems, like two entities are binding together, for example, or many proteins are binding together to have a complex multiprotein. So these transitions stand for that. Now, uh, when we are dealing with discrete petri nets, it means that the places are discrete they can get natural numbers only. But when you want to deal with mRNA or protein levels, then we are not dealing with necessarily natural numbers. So we need continuous places. That's why I can use uh, real numbers. So 
continuous number uh, continuous places would be needed but in some cases for example for mutation whether a gene is mutated or not so this is a discrete case zero or one so uh, in this case i should consider both discrete and continuous places in the same model that's why hybrid pet nets are useful when you hear about hybrid pet nets it means that it includes both discrete and continuous place. What do we mean by color? Inside these places, we can have, as we call them, tokens. For example, this is a place, this is a transition. Uh, let me show it like this. It's a transition. By the way, transitions can be shown by a line or rectangular or square so here assume that is as simple as I shown in this example so I can show how many of that entity I have for example three of them if we are dealing with discrete case we are dealing with natural numbers so you can easily show them by dots or you can just write the numbers inside them. Five, for example, it has five tokens. Now, based on the weight of each arc, I understand that this transition can be activated or not. In another word, we call it, uh, does it fire or not? For example, if the weight of this arc is two, then I check in my place that how many tokens I have. Three is more than two. So it means that this transition can fire. So what I have after this transition fires, I will have only one token here, and I will have seven token here because it adds two tokens from here to this place. So that's how the classical patronet works. But for uh, continuous one and hybrid ones, uh, this transition should have a rate. And based on this rate, we can decide, for example, uh, how many of the tokens will be added to the next one and so on. And also it's possible to give weights to the arc and define the rate on the transition based on the inputs that this transition has. This is also possible on Petronet. So when I talk about colored Petronet, what do I mean by that? It means that these tokens I shown here they are exactly the same, right? There's no difference between this point and this one. But if I want to show different tokens, different type of tokens in the same place, like for example, I have two P, three Q, something like that. Then this one, we call it a colored patternet because we are using different type of tokens inside these places. Time patronets can be also very useful because, uh, like for example, in this picture, you see after a point, we are down regulating one specific uh, gene expression. So time uh, patronet could be useful, but uh, in my experience, I didn't even need them to deal with uh, hemoglobin switching, for example. It's possible to use hybrid patternet to deal with the time problem by using uh, both discrete and continuous places. Because uh, we try to avoid new properties as much as possible to make our patternets simpler. But whenever it's not possible, whenever we need those properties, then we should add it. So we should know about all of them. And they are not just limited to these properties that I wrote here. And sometimes you hear about extended patronets. Extended patronets, they have also inhibition. Like for example here, this is an extended patronet because we have inhibition as well included here. Again, inhibition can be modeled without considering the inhibition arc, but this form is very useful and makes our job much easier. So. I myself prefer to use extended patronets. And these days, the softwares, fortunately, they cover mostly uh, inhibition as well. 
Now, these two parts are very important because when you are dealing with uh, biological networks, we should know that these transitions are uh, working in, an, in a stochastic manner. For all biological networks, this is the same story. So if I say, for example, from this place to another, uh, this one will fire uniformly, this is a mistake. And if I have another transition here for another place, then it's not working like uh, in a linear manner, this one fires and this one fires. In biological system, it doesn't work like this. So we should consider the stochastic property of biological system. So for these transitions, uh, I should consider them as the stochastic transitions. And there is a big reason for it, because when I'm running my simulation, I will show you the simulation results. Then in that scenario, I need to run so many simulations in order to get a result. If I consider these transitions as deterministic, just one time simulation, because no matter how many times you try, you will, you will receive the same answer at the end. You will, same, you will receive the same simulation result at the end, no matter how many times you run your uh, simulation. So a stochastic ones could be very useful. The other thing that we are dealing in biological system is that the rates that you receive for kinetic parameters, these rates that I talk about in transition, we call them kinetic parameters. These ones can be vague. These ones are not crisp as we say in mathematics, like this is not exactly two, this is not exactly 3.7. Uh, as you remember in our previous examples, like uh, I told you about grouping genes. Then I gave uh, that I've given you information related to gene expressions in different experiments. You observe that in different experiments, you don't receive the same gene expression level. So when this is the case, it's not true that in my model, I use a crisp number, like to say, for example, uh, all, always the transition rate is two, always this is 3.7. This is not correct. And also my places, I don't know how many uh, tokens I have exactly in my places. I have exactly five, I have 6.2, I don't know but I can approximate them. So that's why fuzzy logic can be very useful to model biological systems. Otherwise, you will have huge errors in simulating what's going on in nature. And if you want to know about fuzzy logic, I'm sure most of you guys know, but let me remind you very fast that, uh, for example, uh, for you guys, when I say the weather is warm, the definition of the weather is warm for you guys is different. If I talk about it in uh, weather temperature, like for example, a person would say starting from 20 degrees centigrade, then I would say the weather is warm. Another person says, for me, 70%. 17 uh, degrees. So this is uh, different from one person to another. So it's not a universal thing to say at 20 uh, centigrade, then this is warm. So how do I deal with that? Then for fuzzy numbers, they show it uh, with different shapes. The most uh, simplest, the most simple one is uh, related to triangle. It means that uh, in this format, you will have three points. You have a triangle, and in this triangle, you will have three numbers, A, B, C. So you can show it as an array, as a topo with three components. So A and B shows your boundaries, and B is the place with the highest membership as we call it. So 
for each one of these points also you can have different memberships here this is the way we can deal with that so when someone else is talking about for example cold weather you can have another fuzzy number for that by the way it should stop here at the same point yes then you will have two different fuzzy numbers this line should match here because they have the same membership one okay now you can see that here we have even intersection between them the weather that you consider warm is considered cold for some people so you see fuzzy numbers can be very useful also for biological systems because now we can deal with an interval and each one of these points they can have a membership function to be more sure for example this is the value that you are looking for when we are talking about just a stochastic uh, biological system or a stochastic models then we are dealing only with this number b that's it we don't consider the rest of it so instead of just saying starting from 20 the weather is warm I can give a fuzzy number for that. So that's the logic for using fuzzy uh, numbers for our places. And also for transition rates, you can do the same. So at the end, when you receive the simulation result, you will receive the fuzzy numbers. So uh, as you can see, the picture is uh, the, exactly the same as the previous one. I shown you here to know that this is uh, a stochastic or this one consider for example fuzzy as a property inside it then we need to give you tables we need to say for example these transitions are defined as a stochastic transitions and so on so it will get even more complicated but for you guys it's just good enough to know that we have different types of computational uh, models and uh, that's how we can deal with simulating biological networks and, and personally i believe that when you consider hybrid and also stochastic and fuzzy and even considering extended pertinence you can cover most of the biological networks and you can easily validate them for example i used the previous one for beta globin and i use this one for brain tumor and uh, if you ask me for example how uh, do i choose for example which pathway so again you should go to that website cake and you find a pathway does cake contain all the components as i say at the beginning of the session that this is not the case you should read different articles in order to know for example even just this little uh, transition rate that's it for example for this one you should read several articles to know for example which uh, transition rate i should use this one and even to consider it as a fuzzy number it takes time so as you can see these uh, topics are very complicated and we usually talk about them in advanced uh, bioinformatics but uh, for you guys i think it was uh, interesting to at least get ideas that what's going on and for those who are interested to be bioinformaticians or at least when you consider uh, continuing your education in computer science, then this could be a minor for you to consider and take bio, uh, bioinformatics uh, related courses, which are very interesting. But you should really love this course. Otherwise, uh, if you are not interested that much, then uh, it could be very complicated for you. As I mentioned in the beginning of the course, that it contains so many topics inside it statistics, computer science, mathematics, biology. So uh, it takes time. But if you are really interested, because this topic is really interesting, then it could be very useful for you. So my goal in this course was to introduce, to you, introduce you, uh, about uh, topics related to bioinformatics. And I hope uh, you got the idea that uh, what's going on. But in the exam, of course, we are trying everything manually. Uh, but uh, you can practice it after the semester just to try uh, 
the examples that we have and try to uh, write programs for them to practice that how you can deal with them. It could be interesting. Okay, so I mentioned about uh, two examples, uh, beta globin and brain tumor. And for example, for psychological systems, we can do the same. Even for biological systems, we can sometimes have such complicated pettiness. So it's not as easy to say there is one arc from one place to another and so on. Uh, it can be complicated. So here, for example, I try to simulate uh, mood based on emotions. So our emotions are interacting with each other uh, and all the components are interacting with each other. So again, to understand each one of these uh, rates, we should, for example, study very much to understand what's going on between each one of them. So as you can see, these things could be uh, very complicated. And uh, if you are really interested in these topics, uh, we really need uh, bioinformaticians, more bioinformaticians to deal with that. And hopefully some of you will be interested uh, in this topic. Uh, so again, to sum up, we have we had different types of patronets and uh, I can also give you some uh, rough examples, like again for the classical petronet. Uh, let's say we are talking about hydrogen and oxy oxygen, and you have water here. So here I should specify, for example, if you have two hydrogen molecule and one oxygen, then you will have one water. So this is the way it works. So based on the available tokens in them, you can have uh, water molecules uh, as much as tokens we have. And for hybrid, we have both continuous and discrete places. Like for example, let's say uh, this place is for mutation. And whenever I put a token here, I can inhibit a specific transition. Like for example, for a beta globin, for beta thalassemia, we have this problem actually. Beta globin is downregulated by a mutation. And this transition won't be activated anymore or can't be fired as we say in Petronet. So there are maybe several places here and this mutation inhibits this specific square but the thing is that uh, is it down regulated totally I mean uh, does it knock down the gene expression totally this is also another challenge so not always this is a good idea to show mutations by inhibitions like this because this inhibition would avoid any firing from this transition. So this is also another challenge uh, we are dealing with, but uh, in my articles I also mentioned how we can deal with that. And when we talk about uh, stochastic uh, patternets, so for our simulation results, uh, you will see that this is such a mess here. This is such a mess because if I want to reach a simulation result like this in hemoglobin switching because for deterministic models easily I can reach this one. But when we talk about a stochastic one, it sounds like such a mess. But how do we deal with that? Uh, we have so many simulation runs. So we get the average of them and you will find a better trend like this. And you get ideas that what's going on here. And we are interested to reach a steady level. It means that if I consider a neighborhood like this, I should, from, for example, this point, 1,000, my simulation should show the trend between this interval. If I reach that, this is a steady level. And uh, usually uh, computer scientists are very interested in a steady level because of this. Because if you reach that, no, no matter how many simulations you will have in your uh, model, then it should be in this interval. If you reach that, it means that 
uh, you reach the steady level and you can report your simulation result. And that's the beauty of a stochastic pessimist because we are not only dealing with a deterministic one that has only one simulation, which has most probably high errors. And when we talk about uh, fuzzy simulations, as you can see now, we are dealing with fuzzy numbers, not just a point. Because if I want to report my result here, I would say, okay, what's the point here for 1,000? It says, for example, 185. So I will report this one as the simulation result. But for fuzzy numbers, I should uh, report an interval. And these points, uh, as you can see here, for example, this one is exactly the point that you report for the stochastic one. And these points are the boundary points. So they are A, B, C. If you are interested, of course, uh, you can uh, read my articles in Google Scholar and ResearchGate to know more about it. And for a stochastic one, I also have, an, uh, have a video related to a stochastic processes uh, in a stochastic course. If you haven't uh, taken this uh, a stati a statistic course from me, then I would suggest you guys to watch that video related to stochastic processes. Then you get a better idea that what's going on uh, in this topic. Okay, guys, as you know, uh, this topic is not included in your final exam. Lectures 13 and 14 won't be included in the final exam. You already had a good performance for your weekly assignments and uh, midterm exam, so hopefully uh, it will be the same for the final. Uh, I've done my best. Hopefully, you will do also your best for the final, and we will have so many good scores, and I'm pretty sure it will be the case. If you guys have, have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I will see you guys. Uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, I will have interaction with you. Hopefully, in email, we will interact with each, with each other because there won't be any online sessions. And hopefully, I will see you in other courses or other matters. See you guys.